And I think you can think of two other problems. So the solution to the problem, we're talking about the federal government and how the federal government is going to resolve these issues, okay? So that is um, the essay question. As a reminder, the introduction is worth five points. Two of those points are the thesis statement. Each of the problems, the identification is one point, two points is the explanation, two points is the solution, okay? The conclusion is worth three points and citing something, anything, you know, not Wikipedia, anything that's not Wikipedia. Oh, I don't know, I'm throwing my, there we go. Um, anything that's not Wikipedia or, you know, this blog on, you know, this thread I followed on Reddit, right? So in other words, say in lecture, Dr. Rallett said, or in the textbook, that's good enough, okay? You can be specific if you want to and you have plenty of time, so why not? Why not make me go, very nice, right? Um, but I mean, the point is you can say, in lecture, Dr. Rallett pointed this out, or in the book, it said this, or in the workbook, I read this, okay? And that is good enough. That is good enough. No, no Facebook memes that your grandma shared, Josh. That is also verboten. Okay. So, um, the next is um, that the rest of the exam, 75%, is going to be multiple choice questions. 30 of them will be from Cengage and lectures since the last midterm. The other 20, 10 will be from section one and 10 will be from section two, okay? 10, section one, 10, section two, okay? And they will be the easiest possible things, all right? The easiest possible questions. I already gave you one. Do you guys remember what question I gave you on Monday? What are the two houses of Congress? Yes, that's right, Josh, good job. And I bet your grandma's meme can't even tell you that. So um, no, no use studying Facebook for this, all right? Um, so when we talk about that, that's one possible question. Another question I think that I almost always put on there is um, what was Brown versus Board of Education about? Can anybody tell me what the holding in Brown versus Board of Education is? It reversed the decision of Plessy versus Ferguson. It did. And so that meant that? There was no more segregation. Or at least it didn't begin immediately, but it, that's what started the process for that. Right. And the whole thing was separate is inherently unequal. Right? So you guys know that. That's easy cheesy. And if you don't know that, you should know that. So know that for this class. Okay. So there's two. That's two out of those 20 right there. Easy. All right. So um, I want to remind you guys that your final is on Wednesday. It will open up at 8 a.m. Canvas may say something else right now. That's because I haven't put the new one in. Okay. So it will open up at 8 a.m. on Wednesday. It will close at midnight on Wednesday. That is the time you have. So you will only have two hours once you open it to do it. Rebecca asked if you could cut and paste. So if you'd already written your essay, if you could put it in. And the answer is yes. So write your essay in advance and then study the multiple choice. Right? It's pretty easy. Okay, so um, that's that. And um, now we're going to talk about, we're gonna take roll. Eric, you ready for your last roll taking? Oh, I'm ready, not to worry. The question is, are the students ready? Philip, we know that you have a problem with your phone. It's not your phone. Yeah, Philip's didn't work, I already know. <laughs> hey, we know you there, we can see you. Thanks, Philip. Right. Who, else, what, who else will I have to fix? Let's see who I call out. <laughs> oh, yes, I'll oh, you, you're there, so it's not the same. 
You know, okay, is it live? It is, it is live. Okay, it's live. Oh, and don't forget to do the evaluations for us. I put that in the chat, but. Uh, hmm. uh, yeah, they should be in your email, so do evaluations. Yeah. That way you can see how bad I was. You can, I would prefer you say how good I was. Just so you know, you can say how bad Eric was and how great yeah. I was. Yeah. I'm not a pretender. <laughs> or something like that. Ooh, Callie won't miss it today. Okay, so today we're gonna have a round table. You guys got to tell us what you thought was the most important problem in American politics. And now the fellows and I are gonna tell you a problem that we see and how we think it should be fixed. All right, so um, since Eric is doing role, I think I'm going to start with Michelle and then come back to um, Eric and then Manas and then I will go to Rochelle, okay? Okay, nothing like going first. <laughs> um, so I think one of the major problems that we have is climate change and protecting our environment. And I know I read several papers on that. Um, you know, the earth's temperature is up like 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit due to human activities it affects so much about our lives and our world. Um, we have you know, animal species going extinct. We have ecosystems in danger. Um, ocean temperatures up, ice sheets are shrinking, sea levels are rising. Um, I think it's only a matter of time until it affects you know, our food security, um, our water supply. And it's just, I, I really strongly believe that we need to be better stewards of our environment and our planet. And so there are several things that the US federal government can do to help protect our environment. Um, the first, and I think probably the most obvious, obvious one would be switching from our reliance on fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. Um, I think we need to you know, actually um, enforce some of the regulations on the oil and gas industries to limit their emissions. Um, we need to stop subsidizing them. Um, we are still subsidizing fossil fuel industries, oil and gas. And then I think that in addition to that, we need to fund and subsidize renewable energy sources instead um, and, and give like tax incentives for existing companies to switch to clean energy. Um, we also could fund more research into renewable energy um, including things like nuclear power, which has historically had kind of a bad connotation. People hear about nuclear power and they're worried that it's, you know, it's dangerous. We do have some problems to solve with it, like safety, um, safety concerns, um, what to do about like waste disposal, things like that. But I think with more funding to research, I think, you know, it is a clean energy. Um, let's see, other, other things that we could research more that the, that the government could fund would be things like um, technologies like uh, batteries, how to make batteries to store some of the clean energy uh, more affordable for consumers. Um, so there are a lot of electric cars on the road already, um, something like a, a million electric cars on the road in the US, and the technology is becoming more affordable. I remember when electric cars first came out, they were just so much more, ex more expensive than you know, gas powered cars that it wasn't really feasible for a lot of people, myself included. Um, but as that technology becomes more affordable, I think what we need to do is have the federal government really fund and make an effort to increase the infrastructure for electric vehicles, you know, more charging stations. And that can be a federal, um, federally funded effort. They can also work with um, state and local governments to, you know, implement a plan and make, make electric cars more feasible. So the other idea for um, infrastructure that would be more environmentally friendly would be high-speed trains. Um, I know that we have some Amtrak. Yes, I love high-speed trains. For anybody who has spent any time in Europe, uh, it's amazing. You know, it's, it's like every major city is linked. There's tons of stops along the way, but it's not like the U.S. train system or the U.S. bus system where it's, it just takes so long that you don't want to do it. So I feel like if we had high-speed train, 
it would really lure some people away from using cars. Um, and it, it just, it also sort of equalizes opportunity because even if you don't want to, or if you can't afford to own a car, whether it's electric or gas, you can afford a train ticket. Um, so the cost is extreme for high-speed trains. And that's that's been one of the problems. But along with that, it's just, I think a lot of Americans are very attached to the idea of cars. Um, I, I think it was, yeah, it was under Obama where they they tried, they actually tried to give states funding to build high-speed trains. And a lot of, there's just a lot of pushback. Some Republican governments didn't want it. Um, they just felt like they were making a statement by refusing that federal funding, saying that the government spent too much money, basically. They were more for a small government. Um, part of that, I think, was some of the speeds of the train. Like, I'm from Ohio, and there was, I, I think it was back in 2010, there was a train planned that would link Cincinnati, Columbus, and Cleveland. And they were billing it as a high-speed train, and it was going to be federally funded. But do you know how fast the high-speed train was that was planned? It was 39 miles an hour. And so after that was criticized, they upped it to 50 miles an hour. Okay, that's, like, I would drive. You know, I wouldn't take a train that had multiple stops that would only go 50 miles per hour. So I know Biden is all about high-speed trains and developing our rail network. Um, and I would love to see that happen more with federal funding and subsidies and encouragement there. Um, but the key part of that is getting up to the speeds that we see in Europe. But I know California is doing a good job of that. There's a California rail authority that is, um, their trains are planned to be like 200 or 220 miles per hour, which is awesome. Um, right now, Amtrak, what they bill as their high speed trains like on in the Northeast corridor, they go like maybe 125. So I think part of you know developing this rail system would be actually just making sure they're high speed trains. Um, Okay, I got a little bit carried away on the high-speed trains, but I have a couple other points too. So the other things that I think the federal government could do would be to establish and enforce new building standards for new developments. You know, we keep sprawling out, we keep overtaking more and more of like our, our wildlands, our, our, our forests. We keep clearing more and more as we sprawl out. And so I think we could have more plans to maybe build up. And then also as we build out, just to have you know, like some some standards in place, you know, like net zero buildings, um, you know, using more sustainable sources. Um, and then in addition to that, I would love to see new protected areas like new national parks established or the sizes of our existing national parks and wildlife refuges expanded um, when possible. Um, and then also just encouraging states and cities, counties to you know, preserve their lands to establish parks and protected areas through additional funding to them. So I think that's all I've got. I really, I really feel like one of the best things that we can do for ourselves, for our children, for our future, I know it sounds cliched, but is to, you know, preserve our environment, save our physical world. And that's all I got. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> okay, Eric, you're up. Okay, here we go. Okay, so the issue that I want to focus on today, uh, I don't know if you've heard about it in the news recently, is student loan debt. Um, it's a major issue that is uh, taking over the news, and Joe Biden's campaign is promising and discussing the idea of a $10,000 loan write-off. Well, I'll first start off with the issue. Um, I do not believe in student loan debt cancellation. I don't believe it's a physically good policy to do. So the issue is that we have $1.7 trillion in student debt here in the United States, uh, which is more than all credit card debt uh, in the United States. It's only second to mortgages. So a whopping amount of debt. And here's where we have some problems with uh, equability is that less than half of all the taxpayers within the United States have a college degree. So asking taxpayers across the United States to foot a $10,000 student cancellation debt bill uh, would be affecting both those who have it and those who do not have it. So this all kind of started back in 1965 um, when the federal government decided that taxpayers should guarantee student loans and that the federal government should back these student loans 100%, um, which did bring some good in there, but we've had a runaway of 
debt, and there's some reasons for that. The federal government does not look at credit scores, fields of studies, uh, and what your degree will be in, and whether it'll be, say, not profitable, but whether you'll actually use it in real life. I'm not going to go into majors that don't make any money, but there are some that are not as worthwhile um, to getting a job. Um, you'll see that one day. So between 2005 and 2016, um, this is an interesting thing that nearly four in 10 student loans, and most of these were federal backed loans, went to borrowers with credit scores below the subprime threshold of 620. So many of the people getting loans, student loans, were not even credit worthy to get a loan in the first place. And you ask, well, I'm an undergraduate student. Why does that apply to me? I don't have any credits. Uh, a lot of the debt being taken out is by graduate students um, to take on these degrees like Master's of Business Administration, these kind of community degrees that are coming out. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, the median debt right now is about 24000 per student. And um, so my policy proposal, I believe that the federal government should uh, relinquish its role in backing student loans at the 100% level and have colleges, individual colleges, guarantee 50% of the individual student loans um, if the student does not graduate. And if the student graduates, the college has to guarantee at least 25% of the loan. So if a student or a graduate does not or falls behind on their payments and becomes delinquent, that college is responsible for that student falling behind. So there's a financial incentive and all that to kind of reform a cost and who gets a loan. So just this upcoming with this $1.7 trillion that's gonna to have to be repaid, um, borrowers will pay back about 935 million of that. So that's about two thirds. Um, but individual taxpayers are gonna be left on the hook for $435 billion. So a lot of money going to taxpayers and half of them don't even have a college degree. So this elitism kind of talk. Um, one challenge that this policy will face is that those who have already taken out debt uh, will still want theirs paid off. Um, and there's a lot of people like that. Um, so this policy does not address past debt, but what it is gonna do is address future debt and future college costs. So some of the benefits of this would be that the cost of college uh, is probably going to decrease um, because it's gonna rethink student debt loads um, when they have a financial stake in the policy. So it's just not give one to every student in basket weaving degree who will never get a job, maybe. Sorry if that's your degree. I don't think it's a real degree, but. Um, and then non-college educated individuals uh, would not be left out without a complete burden of providing for those who go to college. So it'll provide a more equitable sense for them um, and that they don't have to put out a lot. So the ultimate goal is to bring greater control to the student loan market. Um, you know, we're having just a little too much student debt, I believe. Um, and this will allow colleges to require degrees that are useful and not useless ones where students have no chance of getting a job through that university um, in that area. So I believe this would also help with degree completion uh, because colleges would have another financial incentive to get students um, graduated, whereas right now the um, incentives are not as high to get you out. Um, so that's my policy proposal to kind of reform student loan debt. And I'll accept any questions. Ooh, raises the question, what's the important degree? Uh, so universities currently have to report to the federal government earnings on certain degrees after college, um, and that'll have to be looked at by legislatures, um, and it could be at a state level. Uh, that would have to be written into the policy. Um, any other questions? And I, I think this does provide more equitability because those who have already taken out loans, um, there are those in the world who have to pay through their way through college. So erasing debt does not help those who are paying their way through college at community colleges and all that kind of stuff. So that's what I got.
Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it should be noted that some people do have student loan debt who did not graduate from college. Oh, yes. a lot of people, and, and so there are a lot of people with debt that did not actually graduate. Correct. Um, okay. Um, Maness is next, and I'm going to share a screen for her. Thank you. So I am from Malawi, and I chose an issue that affects my country as well. Um, so the problem I see in the world is that foreign aid is not effective in uh, developing nations or recipient countries. Um, we have two outliers, uh, that's uh, South Korea and Taiwan, where foreign aid has actually uh, resulted in economic development, but for the rest of the world, foreign aid is not um, producing the intended outcomes. So when I talk about foreign aid being effective, I mean that it's producing the desired outcomes. The reason as to why that's the case, I'll speak for the case of Malawi. Um, since independence from the British in, uh, in the 1960s, we were under a dictator. That was the, the downside. Um, but foreign aid was effective. Just looking at economic development, uh, economic growth from 1960 to 1990, there is an upward trend. But then since the 1990s, we've had uh, problems with public administration. Uh, there's, there has been really poor policies and corruption and all of those uh, problems in developing countries. As a result, uh, when foreign aid comes in, it is not used for the intended purposes, unfortunately. As a result, there is uh, a negative correlation between foreign aid and economic development. And so there is this whole uh, goal of foreign aid that the, uh, it, the goal is to alleviate poverty in the world. But it's surprising that thus far we only have these two countries where foreign aid has been um, effective. And so I, I think that if we look at what South Korea did and what Taiwan did for, the, uh, for them to uh, use foreign aid effectively so that it produces the desired outcomes, we can do similar things uh, in these other countries uh, just to make sure that people are not suffering as much as it is now. Um, foreign aid has been in existence for over 60 years now. And to me, it does not make sense that all this time, foreign aid has not um, reduced poverty in the most of the developing world. And so something is wrong. Uh, I do think that if it was effective, there would definitely be less people suffering today. I'm speaking from uh, experience being from Malawi. There are a lot of people who do not have jobs. That doesn't make sense to me. So 85% of the population live in rural areas and all they do is subsistence farming. There is not a lot of e uh, economic activity. So the, uh, it means just 15%, about 15% live in uh, cities where people actually have jobs and they have better housing and running water, electricity. The rest of the country, that's not the case. So I think that a policy that guarantees the uh, effectiveness of foreign aid in these struggling countries, that would um, make the world a better place. I understand that it shouldn't be uh, the job of the United States government, federal government in the US, to solve the problems of uh, the people, the citizens in Malawi. It should be the government in Malawi solving the problems of the citizens in the country. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And 
the U.S. has always been so generous that um, I personally have benefited through education uh, from foreign aid from the United States. So I think a policy that guarantees uh, effectiveness of foreign aid in developing countries would make um, life uh, much better in these countries. That's all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, Maness. Um, any questions? All right, Rashid. Oh, wait. Um, I, I think Dimitri asked how to decide which countries receive aid, but I think um, she didn't necessarily mean that countries wouldn't receive aid, just that it was administered better. Is that right, Maness? I'm sorry, I'm answering for you. Correct, correct. Yeah, but just looking at history, um, usually uh, the governments do have strategic uh, benefits from foreign aid. So they, uh, when they're giving aid, they're not just like, okay, here's money, use it for whatever you want with it. So for instance, the US can give foreign aid to Malawi because they want Malawi to be a democratic country. So those countries that subscribe to what the US wants, for instance, becoming a democracy, they will receive aid. That's just one of the examples. Thank you so much. Okay, Rashid. Hi, everyone. So actually now I am in Bangladesh. So if somehow my internet connection is not working properly, so please forgive me. So for today's, I think my most important policy should be the minimum wage. So when I was thinking what policy should we take to save the world? So I was thinking that we should take a policy which will directly affect the life of the people in the society. So when I was thinking about that, I think the minimum wage policy has that kind of effect in the society and the life of the people. So actually, what do we mean by the uh, minimum wage policy? So international labor organization actually says that the minimum amount of remuneration that an employer is required to pay wage earner for the work performed during a given period, which cannot be reduced by collective agreement or an individual contract. That means if a government wants fixed a minimum wage policy, no owner can actually give their employee less than that. So it actually gives uh, the employees the power to uh, bargain with the owners and actually they ensure their rights. So what is the actual situation in the USA about the minimum wage? We can see that USA has a minimum wage policy that named Fair Labor Standard Act that is enacted in 2009. According to that law, US, uh, every US institution has to pay minimum $7.25 since 2009. And we can see that 29 state, US states actually has higher minimum wage rate than that. So what is the problem there? So we can see that the, the wage rate is actually fixed in 2009. After that, there is no ramification of that. After 2009, there is monetary inflation and the increase in the living standard. So uh, uh, According to the ILO, the $7.25 in 2009. Rashad, you're breaking up. Hello. Okay, now it's back. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, so am I going to start from the beginning? Uh, I cannot hear you. No, it was just a sentence or two ago. Okay, okay. Uh, so why do we need minimum? Okay. 
I think it's breaking up again for me. Let's see if you can try without video overshed. Rashad, the last thing that um, we heard was um, that um, talking about the difference in states, and then you were talking about uh, the change in 2009, and so that was the last little bit, and so you said, why should we change the minimum wage? If you want to type that into the chat, that would be perfect. We lost them. Lost them from Zoom. The ancient ones, Philip, or the modern ones? Good question. All right. Um, I think you guys got the idea from Rashad. And so I'm going to put a poll. Which policy do you most identify with of the ones that each of the um, fellows talked about? I have activated that poll. And I'm going to take the time and I'm going to talk for just a second. And I'm going to tell you um, what I think. The Sorry, Zoom kicked me out. It's okay, Rashad. Um, if you want to just tell us why you think minimum wage policy is important, that's where you were. It's the last little bit. Okay. So I think the minimum wage policy is mainly important for two reasons. Actually, it helped to address the uh, income inequality in the society, and that also increased the national productivity. I have two examples, one from the Romania, so Romania has income uh, minimum wage policy from 2004. After that, you ha EU, EU has a study on the Romania. They say, uh, see that from the 2004 to 2018, actually after enacting the minimum wage policy, the income inequality between the rich and poor uh, significantly decreased in the Romania. It is 29% decreased within 14 years. That is a huge impact in case of the economic sector. Also, it increased the national productivity. Uh, there is a 40 years study in European Union about the minimum wage policy. They show that after every minimum wage policy, there is a huge boost in the income uh, productivity of the labor because when there is a minimum wage policy, actually labor doesn't have to think about their economic condition and they are more stable and motivated to do works. So for after every minimum wage policy for three to five years, there is a boost in the uh, productivity of the labor forces. And I have another point is that uh, there is a huge obstacle to imp uh, implement that policy. One of the obstacle is ideological obstacle. We know that most of the Western Hemisphere country actually ruled by the new liberal economic policy. According to the new liberal economic policy, government can't intervene in the market. But when there is a minimum wage policy, government actually fixed the minimum wage. So there is an ideological obstacle that from that point of view. But we have to make sure to show that though there is a government intervention, but if there is a minimum wage policy that actually helped the economy. So by that way, we can just overcome that. And I think for the uh, policy level, government can establish a national wage commission and give incentives to the owners who implemented the policy. I'm trying to make it short because my internet connection is already again disturbing. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Any questions? So there is a question in the chat section. They're saying that if there is a minimum wage increase, there will be a huge boost in the cost of living eventually. So uh, that's why about the minimum wage commission. So after every 10 years, minimum wage commission will actually revisit their decision 
and to try to readjust the minimum wage policy according to the market situation of that time. So suppose there is a policy from 2009 to now. So now US should revisit their policy and try to fix the minimum wage level. That should be more than the $7.25. Thanks, Rashad. Um, I am going to do the poll one more time because I don't think everybody um, signed in. So you only have 60 seconds. There was only 125 and, and Rashad had not quite completed yet at that point. So um, I'm redoing the poll about which one you think is most important. And I hopefully we'll get more than 130. It's about 30 seconds left in the poll. I still have your vote over there, Philip. Well, we actually ended up with fewer people that time. So um, there's that. People like your beard. That's important, right? Um, about 50% are going to say uh, address global warming. 27% um, are going to say reforming the student loans. 6% uh, are going to be in favor of for more effective foreign aid. And 17% increasing the federal minimum wage. All right. So it seems like we're a little bit more environmentally minded in this class. Um, I want a variety of issues. There have to be two problems. So it can be two distinct problems, clean air and uh, clean water, for example, right? I mean, those are two distinct problems, um, but it can't just be the environment. You solve it by more electric cars or you solve it by, as Michelle said, um, Hydroelectric trains, not hydroelectric trains, electromagnetic trains, hydroelectric trains, that's awesome. Okay, so um, my problem I'm going to point to is this, all right? I think the problem is that in the United States is voter turnout. As compared to the rest of the democratized world, we turn out at much lower rates. This year was an amazing improvement. We went from an average over the last, you know, since the 1970s of between 50 and 60% people turning out who are eligible to vote. This year it was 69%. 69% of Americans as compared to the highest it had been is the highest it, ha it has been in a hundred years. And the reason is mail-in voting. And so I am a proponent that there be uh, mail-in voting, um, that it'd be easier to vote. We have an election season instead of an election day. Uh, that there be more opportunities for voting and so that more people actually do get to have their voice heard. After all, this is about democracy, right? And so the more of us who can vote do vote, the more our actual votes will be heard. This is the largest turnout in the history of the United States. Obviously, we have more people, but it is the largest percentage turnout in 100 years. You guys, over 100 years. That's amazing. And it had a lot to do with the fact that people said, okay, it's gonna be hard to vote. So let's figure out ways to make it easy for people to vote. And people did. Maricopa County in Arizona had an 80% turnout rate, 80%. Four years ago, they had a 52% turnout rate. Hawaii in also doubled their rate because they uh, changed to uh, mail-in ballots available to everyone and they were mailed to everyone. Their turnout doubled this past year. These things make a difference. And so if you actually want to hear the voice of people, if you want democracy to work, then mine is mail-in voting. All right, so um, we have heard from you guys as far as what you think are most important because you wrote papers, which I really appreciated. Um, and so, um, but if you would like to weigh in and talk about something, then I would um, like to hear it. And, and one of the things too, it should be noted is that in Maricopa County, 
only 160,000, 65,000 people showed up on the day of the poll. Think about that, 165,000 and 2 million voted remotely or previously or by mail. Okay. All right. What do you guys think? Thoughts? Do you want to weigh in? You want me to say boomer so you can say sooner and say goodbye? Is that what you really want? All right. Boomer! Sooner! 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 Sooner.